much. You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. It's 1994 at Charlestown Square Shopping Centre in Newcastle, New South Wales. Teenage schoolgirl Gordana Katevsky is browsing her favourite stores with her best friend Belinda. There's a skirt in just jeans that Gordana's been eyeing off, so she heads into the change room to try it on. When she emerges from the cubicle to get Belinda's opinion, a man steps out from the change room beside her. (laughs) That looks nice he says. The blood drains from Gordana's face. Flustered and afraid, she gets back into her clothes and rushes Belinda out of the store as quickly as she can. It's not the first time Gordana has seen this man at the shopping centre. She can't be certain, but Gordana feels like he's been popping up everywhere lately. From unsettling encounters at her after-school job at the deli, to the supermarket and the car park. She calls him the spook. Back at Charlestown shops a few weeks later, Gordana and Belinda notice the spook again. This time, he's following them. They seek refuge in the nearby shop of a family friend who describes the girl's reaction to his presence as terrified. Then come the phone calls. A man ringing the Katevsky home, asking after Gordana specifically. He claims to be calling from a store Gordana's mother has never heard of. It's called Gumleaf, and it's new, he says. He asks Gordana questions like, Do you like swimming? What do your swimmers look like? What's your bra size? The store, Gumleaf, it doesn't exist. And on a balmy November night in 1994, after months of unnerving intimidation and stalking, 16-year-old Gordana Katevsky is taken 30 metres from her auntie's home. The spook's identity remains a mystery, and Gordana is never seen again. I'm Emma Gillespie and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. On the 24th of November 1994, 16-year-old Gordana Katevsky was walking home from a local shopping centre when she was abducted, around the corner from her aunt's house in the Newcastle suburb of Charlestown. Gordana was just moments from the front door when, at around 8.45pm, she was dragged into a white Toyota Hilux by two men and never seen again. Despite wide-scale police searches, multiple eyewitness accounts, ongoing public appeals and rewards, special strike forces and a coronial inquest, Gordana's body has never been found and no one has been held to account for her presumed death. Gordana Katevsky's loved ones have spent the nearly 29 years since the night of her kidnapping in an unrelenting search for answers to learn what happened to this schoolgirl. A daughter, a sister, a niece, a friend. Amelia Saw is a journalist and former national crime reporter for News Corp, whose coverage of this case has been comprehensive and considerable. In 2018, Amelia shed light on a significant breakthrough in the case, with allegations Gordana's disappearance could be linked to multiple cold cases of other missing young women, of whom no trace has ever been found. Amelia joins me now. Let's start in November 1994. Can you take me to Charlestown Square on the 24th? What do we know about Gordana Katevsky's movements? Yeah, so Gordana was a 16-year-old girl. She'd been out shopping with her friends that night on Thursday night, late night shopping. She was super excited, you know, really smiley. People who'd seen her walking down the street that night later said that she had this like really kind of uplifted gait in her walk and 
she had been given permission to go to her first concert that weekend, a boys to men concert. So she was super excited. She was shopping for an outfit. She left the shopping centre just as it was getting dark around seven and started to walk home to her aunt's house, which was a short kind of five minute walk from the shopping centre. We know that she didn't make it home that night. How close was she to making it to her auntie's? And what do we know happened on that walk? Yeah, so I think this is probably one of the most chilling and heartbreaking aspects to this case is that Gordana was actually 42 steps from her aunt's house, so about 30 metres. Apparently it was the first time she'd ever walked home alone, which is kind of interesting. So she was kind of walking down the dip of this hill down Powell Street in Newcastle And we know from witnesses that there was a white Toyota Hilux and it was driving down the street. And when it saw Gordana, the Hilux actually did a U-turn and turned around and parked on the side of the street where she was going to walk past and turned its lights off. There were two men in the car, one darker kind of featured man and one who kind of had short, blonde, surfy-like hair. So that's the description we have of the guys. So she's walking down the street. She's, you know, a few steps from her aunt's house. She gets pulled into the car. Now, what's really shocking is that there were a lot of witnesses around. So it's kind of quite unusual. Her aunt and uncle were actually making dinner at the time. They remember being kind of roused from what they were doing because they heard a woman screaming and she was screaming no with increasing kind of urgency and that kind of unsettled them to the point where they actually stopped what they were doing and went outside and had a look down the street. And as they looked down the street, they saw this white Toyota Ute disappear around the corner, but it was only afterwards that they realised that they were actually watching their niece being abducted. How long did it take before the dots were put together and Gordana's family realised that she was missing? Yeah, it wasn't actually that long. Her sister was a bit older and had come to Newcastle to visit her. So her sister rang the aunt's house, I think it was about 9pm, and said, was Gordana home? Could she talk to her? The aunt said she hadn't come home. And so then they did the next step, which was to ring her best friend, Belinda, thinking she might have stayed at her friend's house. But when she wasn't there, the aunt went down to the street and found Gordana's possessions by the side of the road. So it was a shopping bag she was carrying. It had some stockings and her wallet in it. The shopping bag had been torn, like ripped out of her hand. And police would later be able to, many years later actually, be able to find some fingerprints on that shopping bag, Gordana's, but also the offender's. Amelia, before we go much further, what can you tell me about Gordana as a person? What kind of a teenager was she? What did she like? Where was she at in life? So according to her family and friends, her mother described her as a really happy child. She was always smiling and really positive. She came from a Macedonian family, which was quite large and tight knit. She was quite close to her relatives, but also for a 16 year old I think particularly by today's standards, really quite innocent. You know, her sister recalled that Gordana used to wake her up in the middle of the night if she wanted to go to the toilet. And because she'd kind of come from these parents who had come from quite a strict kind of Macedonian background, she wasn't really allowed out much. So after she was abducted, in fact, two days later, she was going to go to her very first concert, which was a boys to men concert. So we know she had a really close friend called Belinda who is still very traumatised by this case. And, yeah, she was just a happy-go-lucky kid. She had a part-time job. I suppose the only tricky thing that we know she was dealing with, it was kind of discovered after the fact that she had been being stalked by someone. But other than that, I mean, she yeah, she was just a really good kid and she may not have even had her first kiss. Like this was a really sweet young kind of 16 year old. We will get into the sort of stalker side of things, the revelation that came out many, many years later. But in terms of the immediate aftermath of Gordana's disappearance, what was the police response in those first hours? Look, the police response in those first hours, I understand they didn't leap to action very quickly and that was later criticised by the coroner when there was an inquest into Gordana's disappearance. 
And one of the great frustrations of the family is that they kind of alerted the police, but not much was done in those first 24 hours, which, as we know, um, is a really critical time, particularly in that, you know, there was a lot of strong evidence that showed that Gordana had been abducted. People could kind of describe the car and give a loose description of the two men who were inside. So that was the first hours. What kind of did happen, though, was that the police did swing into action. The Kotevsky's house, so Gordana's family's house, became like ground zero of the investigation. Her mum says she can barely remember that time because it was, as you can imagine, so incredibly traumatising. She she felt she didn't really know where she was or what she was doing, but just there were a lot of people in the house and she was panicked and desperately needed to know where her daughter was. Their dining room table was covered in photos of Gordana. There were posters out. I believe there were 16 detectives who were put on the case and they worked kind of round the clock for six weeks searching for Gordana. There was also a really close-knit community in Newcastle, particularly with the Macedonian community, but also just other neighbours and civilians who took it upon themselves to do daily searches. Every morning they'd turn up at the house with four-wheel drives and they'd go out looking through scrubs through the you know, local nearby Hunter Valley. So there was a really concerted effort to try and figure out what had gone on. Police interviewed everyone within a 50-kilometre radius who had a white Toyota Hilux because that was the car she was seen being pulled into. They also put a um, a mannequin dressed as Gordana was on that day when she left Charlestown Shopping Centre near the shopping centre, hoping to spark people's memory about what they'd seen or anything they might know to come forward to police. As you mentioned, those first few hours in a response to a missing persons case are critical Is the broad sentiment looking back on those moments that police didn't take it seriously enough initially? Certainly the sentiment is that enough wasn't done soon enough. And, of course, there's no guarantee that there might have been a different outcome. But I think particularly if you're her family or friends, knowing that there had been something that could have been done a bit better in the police investigation must be incredibly frustrating for them. Those two men who are seen by witnesses and identified as suspects, there are police artist sketches that are then released to the public. Did anything come from those sketches? Did anyone recognise those faces? Not that I'm aware of that was provided any kind of concrete leads. There was a bit of a, so I mentioned before that Gordana had been stalked and the description of her stalker actually looked quite similar to one of the sketches that the police released. But this kind of wasn't put together until years and years later at the inquest when one of the detectives noted that the sketch they had for Gordana's stalker looked very much like the police sketch that had been released of the man in the car. So he was kind of this Mediterranean-looking gentleman in his early 20s with kind of dark features So that was a a fairly chilling revelation that happened a bit later. We are, of course, talking about a teenager who disappeared in 1994. At what point did the case initially go cold after that big six-week effort to try and recover clues and evidence or a body? When did the trail go cold and then what was learnt to bring it back into the spotlight? Yeah, it's a great question. So I understand that really after that six weeks they had exhausted all investigative avenues and um, resources were taken off it. It wasn't until there was an inquest in 2003 which found that basically Gordana had been murdered by an unknown person or persons and that she had been a victim of stalking but that was kind of where it finished. Then years later in 2009, Police were obviously reviewing the case and they, because technology had advanced, they were able to get a fingerprint off the shopping bag that Gordana dropped and this time they were able to get a fingerprint for the offender. So that kind of cracked open the case again. It was reported in the media again and the fingerprint was run through their database system. I actually learned in the course of doing this story that fingerprints aren't just kind of automatically match. It's not like this magic science. There is an automated national fingerprint system and that every night once they get a new fingerprint in the system, all fingerprints are kind of matched to see if if there are similarities. 
they might narrow down, say, 200 similar fingerprints. And then for a fingerprint to be an exact match, someone in forensics has to sit there and actually manually do it. So, so we're certainly not at the stage where just having a fingerprint is a magic solution to solving a crime. Anyway, at that stage, there were no matches for the offender's fingerprint, which basically just means they haven't been picked up by the police. They haven't been in custody. Now, when I spoke to the police at the time about this, I was like, well, you know, but that fingerprint's on the system. Like if you've arrested someone since and taken their fingerprints, could a match come up at any time? And they kind of said, well, yes, but also it needs to be manually matched. Oh, my God. Yeah. I had no idea that that's how it's quite fascinating. Yeah. fingerprinting worked. I always just assumed like in the movies, you know, if someone enters their fingerprint for the yeah. first time into the database and it's already there, it's like, you know, sirens and lights. Yeah, and yeah, it's all a bit the matrix. Blaring the matrix <laughs> stuff, being like match, match, match. So in 2003 there is inquests and reviews of the case. This revelation comes to light of this stalker. Who was the spook? In the weeks and months before Gordana was abducted, she began to complain to her closest friends and her family about this guy who just seemed to be showing up at places. And he made her really very uncomfortable. So Gordana used to work at a deli and there's a particular instance where her best friend remembers that Gordana said to her, oh, can you take over the counter for a second? You need to serve. And it was later revealed that that was because the spook, as we call him, was actually in the line and was waiting to place an order. So he kind of really, you know, made her quite uncomfortable. There were other instances where he kind of just pop up at places. Her best friend Belinda tells of another time when they were both trying on clothes in a shopping centre and Gordana had gone into the change rooms and stepped out in this garment she was trying on and the gentleman stepped out of the cubicle beside her and looked her up and down and said, that looks nice. So it's really kind of creepy behaviour and the girls were really quite scared of him. You know, there there were times they'd run into shops really flustered and scared because they'd seen him. And there were a few other things that cropped up, like strange phone calls. Godana's house got a strange phone call from a man who was looking for her. And when she did end up speaking to the man on the phone, he asked very inappropriate questions, you know, about like what size bra she had and did she like to go swimming and just just really kind of weird questions. So the thing about the spook, though, is no one can remember a name for him, incredibly frustratingly. After Gordana was abducted, obviously, this came up in, in everyone's mind as really the only possibility for a, a suspect. I mean, in her friends and family's mind, they couldn't think of anyone who'd want to hurt Gordana. But they did think to mention this guy, the spook. And obviously, police were kind of pressing them for a name so they could try and investigate him. I think it was her mother and the friend remembered Gordana telling them the man's name, but they couldn't recall it when police asked. And police actually went to the extent of hypnotising the mother and the friend to see if they could try and recall what this man's name was. I think in the end the police decided that, you know, the spook, whoever that man was, probably wasn't involved. They kind of discounted him. But still to this day when you speak to her friends and family, That's the only person they can think of. And certainly by the nature of the attack, it seems kind of quite unnerving that someone was waiting that close to her aunt's house. I mean, it it could have been opportunistic. It could have been two people who were driving down the road, saw this young woman and decided to abduct her, or it could have been quite a pointed attack. That's still kind of a little bit unknown. As someone who has been deep in the detail of this case for such a long time. How does that sit with you that police have sort of discounted the spook, as we call him, as a serious suspect? Do you think that that's fair enough? Or is there a gut feeling from you that he might be the person who took Gordana? Well, I mean, I think because we don't have, you know, whoever that person's name is, it's hard to narrow down. But certainly on on initial kind of looking at the story, it, there is some suspicion obviously placed on this person. I think something else that came up, in fact, in terms of likely suspects while I was doing these series of stories that really did unsettle me 
was that because these stories had come out published in the newspaper, we got a bit of feedback from the public. And part of that feedback was I actually received a phone call when I was working for News Corp and the story had been in the Daily Telegraph. And I received a phone call at my desk and it was from a woman and she said that she actually believed that she knew who had abducted Gordana Kotevsky. She had a lot of suspicions around a family member of hers, a man who was in her family who around the time Gordana was abducted was obsessed with her. The woman told me the the man had later been caught kind of molesting children in the family and really unnerved them with his obsession around Gordana. He had photos apparently of her all over his room and he had a much younger girlfriend who apparently looked identical to Gordana. This woman, it's quite a big thing obviously to kind of dob in or, or put forward your own family member as someone who could be a suspect in a murder, but she did. She rang Crime Stoppers and gave them the information and I believe they, she's actually rung Crime Stoppers and tried to kind of get this information acted on a few times in the years since Gordana's missing. But the last I spoke to her, she still hadn't been contacted by police, which to me seems really odd because I know actually, in fact, police are working on this case now again. But, yeah, I mean, it was incredibly frustrating for her. I know that she'd gone so far as to kind of nominate this member of her family that she believed for, you know, quite valid reasons could have been a suspect in Gordana's disappearance and she hadn't been contacted despite several calls to Crime Stoppers. Is there a possibility that that suspect could also be the spook, that this could all be one person? Does the description match up? The description apparently matches up with the police sketch of the guy who was seen in the car. I've all often wondered that myself. I mean, who can tell? Because there seems like a lot of weird parallels. Does there seem to be a bit of a disconnect here between the fact that there has been this enormous effort from the police and the community and Gordana's family to find her, to find out what happened to her? You know, it's been nearly a year since a million-dollar reward was posted But then there's this information of someone making multiple attempts to speak to Crime Stoppers to get this suspect on their radar, giving them a name, and that seemingly sort of falling by the wayside. Does that kind of contradict this whole push that we've seen in in the media? It certainly does, and I I don't really know what that disconnect is, but um, it seems to me surprising unless... I mean, obviously I'm not privy to the police investigation and perhaps they're looking at another avenue. They're so set on that avenue that they've discounted this woman's evidence before talking to her. I don't know, but I certainly agree with you that it seems to me crazy that someone could be desperately trying to call crime stoppers and give information and yet they've never been contacted. But who knows? I mean, there could be something else at play that we're just not aware of. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Emma Gillespie. I'm speaking with former crime reporter Amelia Saw about the kidnapping of Gordana Katevsky. In terms of how the case has been in the public eye in more recent years, in 2018, you published a story with revelations from the former state coroner, John Abernethy, who presided over the inquests in 2003. He broke his silence to share his belief that Gordana might have been a victim of a serial killer. What can you tell me about what was learned at that time and and how significant an allegation that is? That was an incredibly serious revelation. I think the fact that it came from the former state coroner, so it's this very senior judicial figure making this allegation. It's not Joe Bloggs down at the pub who reckons she might have been taken by a serial killer. This is a very respected man who knows his stuff, who's, you know, looked at the real intricacies of this case. And he also looked at the intricacies of the disappearance of a number of young women who had all disappeared kind of over this stretch of time between 1978 and 1994 along a stretch of highway in Newcastle. 
Now, when I spoke to John Abernathy, he had already retired and I was actually just meeting him for a bit of a meet and greet. But it was when he said to me that the one thing that still haunted him after his retirement was the disappearances of these girls. You know, these four young women, they were all kind of teenagers or one of them had just turned 20, that all disappeared in similar circumstances. They all kind of looked a bit similar and that all disappeared within about a 20-kilometre stretch of highway. And he said that he always believed they may be related, as in the one perpetrator who, if that theory was proven right, would be a serial killer. I should mention the names of the other cases. So it's Amanda Robinson, who was 14, Gordana Kotevsky, obviously, who was 16, Robin Hickey, who was 18, and Leanne Goodall. So I know that police have been investigating those cases more recently, and there have been some developments in some of the cases. Gordana was actually a bit of an outlier in that mix, in that the other three young women all disappeared within about a four-month period over the summer. Gordana disappeared kind of many years later, but in quite similar circumstances. It was a big deal that this very senior judicial figure who had looked at all of these cases with the kind of, you know, the magnifying class that's used in in an inquest had made this theory that was kind of plaguing him and had continued to plague him into his retirement. For young women, you know, between 14 and 20 to potentially be all killed by the same person, you know, strikes me and I'm sure everyone listening is a really significant, distressing story, something that, you know, you would expect to be hearing about in sort of the history pages. What are the similarities between these disappearances? Why might this be something and and why has it taken so long? I think the similarities were just the circumstances. So, you know, they were young women. Most of them were kind of getting on or off buses or just walking down this, this stretch of highway. The particular stretch of highway that they were taken from or nearby in Gordana's case was really only like, you know, geographically quite a small place, you know. I suppose the reason it hasn't really been publicly discussed or in the media is because at this stage there was no offender and and who knows. I mean, you know, the police are always working behind the scenes. There could be a revelation tomorrow or or in a few a few years or weeks time that they have been linked. But yeah, I, I think with all of these cases, unfortunately, given the time frame they were taken in, you know, policing was very different. I know one of the criticisms the coroner made was that in that stage, like so three of them were taken in 1978. And at that time in Australian history, police stations across the state and even the country didn't have a kind of great information sharing system. So, you know, you might be investigating a disappearance in Newcastle, but you wouldn't necessarily know that your colleagues down in Sydney were looking at a really similar case. The thinking, I think, is that perhaps links and connections and, and even perpetrators were missed in that process. Obviously now the communication's better, you know, there's great information sharing systems and it's a different time. But I think, yeah, sadly for those people who were went missing in that time frame, policing obviously was less up to date and, and the technology was, was way behind what it is now. Obviously Gordana's body has never been found. Is that the case for the other three women for Amanda Robinson, Robin Hickey and Leanne Goodall? That's right. Yeah, and none of their bodies have been found and um, makes the investigation particularly difficult when there is no body, even though, you know, it's quite quite obvious in Gordana's case that she's most likely been murdered and was definitely abducted. So we know that, you know, she didn't just go and set up another life somewhere. Speaking of this notion of a time when police systems weren't necessarily communicating that things could be happening, you know, right under the nose of two different precincts, but maybe they they don't have this connection between offenders. It makes me think of Paul Denier, the Frankston murderer, Mm. who so many crimes that, you know, may have in a different time been seen sooner and, and he may have been stopped earlier. Do you think in a modern context that what happened to Gordana 
could have happened in the way that it did? Even the notion of her having a stalker, is that something that in 2023 we might have taken a lot more seriously and acted on sooner? I guess there's a lot more kind of public education now, but I suppose as well the how innocent she was and how innocent her friends were at that time was very different to what I imagine the average 16-year-old would be now. You know, there's a lot of true crime content out there and for good or for bad, I think that probably gives people an awareness that bad things can happen. I am not for a second insinuating that it was her fault because she was innocent. The thing that struck me when you asked that question about, you know, could a crime like this happen now? Well, I'm sure it could, but I think there would be certain things that would happen a bit differently. For example, you know, this was a time before, and it's hard to imagine, it only struck me when I was like having a read over my notes for the case is that in 1994, teenage girls weren't walking around with mobile phones, right? Now everyone has a camera at their disposal. So if you did have a creepy stalker or some guy that kept showing up at your work, there's every chance you take a photo of him, which, you know, obviously would have been invaluable in this instance. Also, when she was abducted, there were like four teenage boys skateboarding up the road. Another old woman also saw the abduction. So if that had happened today, one would assume probably if you'd seen something like that, you might take a photograph of the car and get the number plate. I know in this case, in terms of narrowing down the Toyota Hilux that was used, this elderly woman did see the car disappearing and she did remember a couple of letters or numbers from the number plate, but she couldn't quite remember the whole thing and not enough to narrow it down and get a match. And again, I I know police hypnotised this woman to try and get her to visualise the number plate and see if she could possibly bring back any more information or details because that could have just, you know, helped narrow it down for them. But unfortunately she couldn't and I understand she's now deceased. Is that a typical tactic I mean, I suppose to the average Joe, it might sound a little bit extreme or even woo-woo, but is that the desperation of police that they were turning to hypnotism or is that actually something that we might be surprised to know is used in investigations quite frequently? Look, I actually don't know how often it's used. I remember being pretty startled by this, but I suppose, you know, if you can get information through hypnosis but then confirm it as a lead that's worked out. But um, no, I don't know, but I just know it was used quite a bit in this case. I know the family, not police, but the family also consulted psychics, which might, you know, like I know there's a lot of scepticism around psychics. You know, people might think, oh, they're wasting their time. But if you're in a desperate situation, I think you try every avenue possible. And they actually had this really weird occurrence that happened as a result of seeing a psychic. So the sister had seen one psychic, obviously, and asking, you know, where Gordana was. And the dad had consulted a different psychic. Both the sister and the dad had acted on their psychic's advice, separate psychics, and arrived at this one house, an old farmhouse, at the same time, and they kind of looked at each other because the farmhouse was in the middle of nowhere. The sister looked at that and like, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Anyway, they went into the house and when they did, they found it was an abandoned house. There was no furniture or anything. They found some wine glasses on the floor that looked like they'd been relatively recently used and some crumbs from Gordana's favourite cake. And I, I know I know it sounds crazy, but I know the family has always thought about that moment. Like it's just one of those Sure, could be a coincidence and maybe it was, but I know it's always kind of given them a bit of a cold shiver thinking that there was this weird kind of similarity between what they'd been told and, you know, the fact that it was her sister's cake and they could tell that this house was abandoned but that you could see from the wine glasses that there were signs that people had recently been there. So, yeah, I I mean, I'm I'm a bit of an embarrassing sucker for that stuff. I'm always drawn in by it, (laughs) even though, you know, like I I know the police would just roll their eyes hearing something like that. But, yeah, I thought it was quite startling when they said that. In terms of Gordana's family all these years searching for their daughter, their sister, their niece, their friend, how have they come to terms with what happened to Gordana with no answers, you know, with no suspect, with no body, how has that impacted their life in the years since? I don't think they have come to terms with it and I don't think having having interviewed, you know, lots of families of missing people as a journalist, 
I think, unfortunately, when someone's missing, they can't resolve it in their head. They can't grieve the person because there's something in every one of us that just wants to believe that that person is somehow going to walk through the door and it doesn't matter how many years it's been or how much the coroner says they've probably been murdered or or whatever, you know, your, your heart, to, for want of a, a better word, you just want to believe. And I remember that was the, one of the things that, so Gordana's mum is a woman called Peggy Katevsky, an incredibly brave, warm, stoic woman. And I went to visit her in the house where she had lived with Gordana in Newcastle. And I visited her in 2018. So, you know, it was almost 25 years since Gordana had been missing at that stage. And there were still, you know, framed photos of Gordana all over the house. But one thing that really struck me was when Peggy was looking around and she was looking for some documents for me and some photos and stuff, and she'd actually kept all Gordana's clothes perfectly folded in the room, which is just, you know, I think it's just a testament to a mother's love for her child and and an unwillingness to accept that that child is perhaps most likely never coming home. I know Peggy has said to me before, you know, she always has hope. You know, she always has hope that Gordana will walk through the door one day, but, you know, she knows that will be a miracle. Gordana's sister, Carol, is someone I've, again, maintained contact with. And Carol recently actually had her 50th and she invited me, which was really touching, I think, just because I've been so involved with that family with this story. But when she stood up at her 50th, so this is now almost 30 years, one of the first things she said was she thanked everyone for coming and and then she kind of teared up a bit and she said, and to my best friend, you all know who I'm talking about, I wish she was here tonight. And she choked back tears. So I think that's a sign that, you know, that just shows the impact that losing someone in this unsolved kind of way just plagues at people's psychology they're just tortured day in and day out hoping for answers and and yeah hoping that ultimately this person returns their life even though they I think their rational mind tells them that's probably not going to happen but without having a body without having a funeral without having a clear understanding of what happened they're just left in this terrible kind of limbo of despair and hope that fluctuates constantly and I don't think they ever stop thinking about the person I know Gordana's father and mother split kind of in the aftermath of her going missing and the father was so devastated in fact that he never returned to work and he spent his whole life kind of trying different ways to look for Gordana. Yeah, they've done all sorts of things. And when you meet families like that and you kind of understand their stories and, you know, the fact that until recently they'd felt quite kind of fobbed off, they didn't even have a contact with the police. I remember asking them, who's your contact with the police? And they said, oh, no one, you know, like because it was so long ago, resources change, detectives move around, so they don't have one one person that I think we all have this idea that one detective looks at the case and then you can always call and get updates, but they didn't really have that. And because, you know, the case was then put in unsolved homicides, unfortunately police have so many cases in unsolved homicide that a lot of, for years, I think there was just no action. You know, the fingerprint came up on the bag. That was quite exciting, but then it couldn't be matched and then went dead again. In 2018, police kind of made this commitment that that they were going to review every unsolved homicide, New South Wales police, I should say, make this commitment that they were going to review every unsolved homicide case. And and Gordana's is one of those, and I understand being looked at at the moment. Amongst all of that sort of tortured pain between the hope and the despair and, you know, who can blame a family psychologically grappling with that? Who knows how you would feel, but there is no peace. Is there frustration as well from Gordana's family that you've seen that these leads aren't being investigated, that this suspect isn't being chased up or taken seriously from the person we spoke about earlier who was contacting Crime Stoppers? Are they so just sort of bereft in in their loss or is there anger there too? I think they're almost past the point of anger. You know, they've kind of been so so broken. It's almost like they just need to protect themselves from feeling those emotions. Certainly there would have been frustration in the beginning, like any family of any missing person. And there were kind of some 
very frustrating things that happened in the initial investigation. So there was some evidence that was lost. An interview statement was lost from from someone that they could get back. Also, really, really frustratingly is the shopping centre had CCTV that would have shown Gordana that night and shown her walking home. But when the police went to get the CCTV, the shopping centre had taped over it. Now, I've never worked as a detective, so I don't, I don't want to criticise them too much, but I imagine those are the things you come up against. They're just these stupid little things. It just must be infuriating when someone's life and a victim's family are left in limbo and it's something as simple as someone's taped over the tape. Obviously, some of it's not necessarily anyone's fault, but, I mean, I always used to get convinced that there was, like, corruption sometimes anytime something would go missing, but I think sometimes it is just unfortunately just human error. Can you describe a bit about the community response and support for Gordana and her family over the decades? You know, Charlestown as a place, it does sort of seem as though everyone there has worked really hard to keep her memory alive. Yeah, it was certainly a close-knit community and, and, yeah, as I mentioned before, they were very involved in initially searching for Gordana. But more than that, I know, for example, I went to see Gordana's best friend who's you know, now a mom and still lives in the area. And, you know, I think she just celebrated her 40th birthday. So these are now, you know, grown, grown adults. But I asked her about Gordana and, and, you know, still her eyes welled up with tears. And she said that they always do something for Gordana's birthday, which is really sweet. Like even after all these years, and she was saying that for Gordana's 40th, which had just passed in 2018, she'd baked a big mud chocolate cake and the family had all got together and, and kind of sung happy birthday to Gordana and imagined what she would have been like, you know, the life she could have had and, and I suppose celebrated her but also felt her absence at the same time. More recently, a million-dollar reward was posted by New South Wales Police. Have we learned anything since that reward was announced? Not that the police are willing to share publicly. <laughs> I'm always trying to get information, but, I mean, obviously you need to respect an investigation and, and sometimes with an investigation I think there's stuff that's probably best that it's not shared publicly until they, you know, you, you don't want to get in the way of an investigation by releasing information that's going to spook someone. But, yeah, I'm not aware of any major developments and the family last time I talked to them wasn't aware of any major developments. I would love for them to have some answers, you know, even if, I mean, you know, it would probably be a worst-case scenario. It would be confirmation that she'd be murdered and and someone had been charged for it and ultimately probably hopefully put in, in prison. But strangely I would love that for the family because they could kind of move on and grieve um, and also, you know, this this is obviously a dangerous predator who's out there. You know, there's community safety as well. In your experience, does that kind of a reward tend to elicit information? I mean, it's not every day that you hear about $1 million being offered from the police. I know the family was really passionate about that amount being offered for her case. And I know actually with with other victims' families, the amount becomes a bit of a sticking point because, you know, obviously, as you can imagine, some families are like, what do you mean my my son or daughter's missing? Why are you only offering $250,000? Why does that person get a million? I don't know the data on how effective rewards are. I just know that they're used as an investigative kind of strategy. And sometimes I think the police don't believe that offering a reward will help. But I guess in this instance, perhaps it's done in a targeted way. Perhaps they think that offering that money will make someone come forward. And I know as well, like as time passes, someone who might not have come forward saying 2009 for a million dollar reward, things change, relationships break down, people die, whatever. And sometimes, you know, they might just get someone who's willing to talk at the right time. And I think rewards are used like that. You have a close relationship with Gordana's family, as you've touched on. How has that developed over the years and how significant are those relationships that you've formed in kind of motivating you? How badly do you, you know, want to help this family find answers? 
you know, it's quite rare to form these relationships with the family. As as you would know, you when you work as a journalist, you kind of cover so many stories, but sometimes one just really sticks out to you. And I think with this one, I covered it so in depth. I went and spent quite some time in Newcastle and spoke to such a wide range of people and really got to know those people to see firsthand how, you know, that it was impacting them. And, and even after so many years, these people, you know, they'd, they'd gone on with their lives as much as they could, but they, they were never really going to move on. So I think that got me really kind of impassioned about doing what I could for this case. And then again, it was quite rare that I'd written these stories and I felt like quite a genuine tip off had come to me, which of course I passed on to the police, the woman who rang up and and nominated her family member. That can be the power of the media in these cases. You know, I think the media often gets a bad rap, but it's an incredibly powerful thing sometimes. And, you know, if, if someone listening to this if that's enough to trigger you to come forward or contact the police, then that's kind of why I would do this interview. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm happy to continue doing interviews about it because, yeah, I suppose if there's anything I could do and, and someone could hear coverage about Gordana and it's enough to make them come forward, well, I'd, I'm happy to put my time and efforts towards that cause. Do you believe someone out there does know something, that there is information? Definitely. Someone has to know something. I know it's a bit of a cliche to say that, but too many people were watching that and there were two guys involved, right? So that kind of ups your chances that at least one of those men is still alive, is willing to, you know, come forward with a bit of information or those men might have told someone. So I do think... As crazy as it sounds, and as long as it's been since it happened, I hope and I, I do think there could be a good chance that this may be resolved. I know I interviewed a detective at the time who had worked on the case and he said what was really striking about this was they actually had quite a lot of evidence. You know, sometimes they, they come into homicides or suspected homicides cold with nothing, but in this instance they had quite a lot of evidence and cases with less evidence have been solved. A huge thank you to Amelia Saw for assisting us to tell this story. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted and produced by me, Emma Gillespie, with audio design by Madeline Joannou. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan. And if you have any feedback about today's ep or maybe an idea for a case we should cover next, get in touch with us. You can send an email to truecrime at mamamia.com.au. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation.